Hello and welcome to Powder Virtual Talks. Empower yourself and join the talk about powder and bulk material transport under ATEX and explosion protection considerations. Thomas Ramme from Volkmann GmbH is going to talk. Have fun. Okay, thank you very much. So good morning everybody and uh, thank you very much for, for hearing me. Um, it's a slightly different subject to the ones before, where it's about protective um, equipment, isolation, suppression, and other things, where um, um, this little uh, chapter here is more about, also about preventive explosion protection, and also, of course, about the, the limitations of that. Um, so um, I will give you a brief introduction and in the end of the day, this can only be a nutshell of our vacuum conveying seminars, which we normally do this time of the year, and our ATEC seminars. And actually, we had it planned for this week, and then because of Corona, it, it went away. And if I look at the, at the roads, well, it would have not been uh, an, an uh, on-site uh, on uh, seminar here in Soest because just of the street conditions. So it's good to meet everybody online. Um, and to have a, a nutshell uh, about uh, vacuum conveying or pneumatic conveying and explosion protection. Um, and right to start with, um, our little company here in Soest, in the heart of Westphalia. Um, um, yeah, we are a real production site. We have 160 employees. We are doing a lot of the designs and the detail construction here in house. We manufacture. Um, most of every, yeah, most of the components in-house. Uh, we have a huge test center uh, for, of course, for vacuum conveying to get conveying heights up to 20 meters, conveying distance up to 100 meters uh, back and forth. Um, so, um, and we love to have a practical approach. We are a family-owned company. Our boss is an engineer, and you see it everywhere when you walk around the factory that we are very technical people um, um, to solve the customer's problems in the end of the day. Um, so the products, I don't want to say here much, but today we will just want to talk about the vacuum conveyors as a transfer method of solids from, from A to B. Uh, other things like sieving, dosing, containment equipment, um, bike bag handling or sack handling, that's uh, all additional equipment to create uh, the process flow for the solids. Um, and this fits very nicely to the previous lectures um, uh, because these pictures are always very difficult to get uh, before and after. Usually you only see the after pictures, the devastating uh, pictures after an explosion occurred. Um, and this is a picture taken before. Um, and one little problem here uh, is of course, um, when we talk about mechanical conveying, we always have to bear in mind uh, mechanical often means um, there can be mechanical sparks, there can be mechanical friction, there can be mechanical heat generation. Um, and also, of course, there often um, electrical equipment um, is uh, added as, as gears, as motors, as drives. Um, so we have often here mechanical potential explosion risk and also electrical explosion risk that is, uh, goes hand in hand usually with mechanical conveying systems. Um, and of course, in the previous lectures, you have seen how to prevent this. Um, and on these pictures, you see what happens if you don't install this preventive um, um, equipment. Um, what happened here is that this grain silo was nearly full and uh, there was an ignition source and the problem uh, with conveying is also, it's in the world. If you have a mechanical spark and then you convey it, you move it probably in an area where you don't want to have it. And that was in this case here on the top uh, where the grain falls into the silo. And of course, grain as a natural product contains, contains a lot of dust. So in this area, there was a dust cloud and an explosion occurred in this area. And uh, this is how the silo looked after that. So you could see it was nearly full um, and then it exploded. And of course, all the consequences here, the explosion, the first silo, and then the first silo is connected with pipes to the second silo. 
uh, there could be the secondary expo explosion and so on. And we have seen this in, in sugar uh, manufacturing plants. Uh, I think sugar is a quite low MIE of around about three millijoule. So all this uh, natural product can be, can be quite dangerous. And of course, this is also speaks for itself. Um, it's always a question of good housekeeping to have uh, not the dust everywhere around you on the floor, on machine elements. If somebody opens a window and a door, you easily have a dust cloud. And of course, this amount of powder is usually fairly enough to generate an explosion. And again, uh, an example, um, in, in the past, a lot of our customers have used uh, mechanical auger conveyors or screw conveyors. Um, and again, you have a mechanical screw rotating in a pipe. Um, and this is a flexible screw conveyor where you can bend the pipe into screw a little bit. Of course, in the bends, you have a lot of friction. Um, you see this here often in the animal feed industry for pellets or even for wood pellets, you see this. And of course, um, this is one of the worst examples I've seen. You see here, this is even uh, burnable material transferred through this mechanical screw uh, with a lot of uh, dangers in terms of friction, heat. Um, you have always an amount of material falling back here. Um, and this could, generate, this could circulate here, the material could circulate here and getting warmer and warmer and warmer until it may come to an ignition. And also, you should not allow here on the bearings uh, all this um, powder layer see on the drive. Uh, so this is really the worst example. And this is just to uh, point out uh, what can go wrong uh, with uh, mechanical conveying systems. Um, when we now talk about pneumatic conveying systems, uh, the, 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 me yeah, the mechanical stuff is out, but we have the pneumatics, of course. And of course, we need to consider that. But anyhow, um, no matter what you choose, you have to consider a lot of things. You have to consider all the different material properties. Then you have to consider what is given by the installation. And then you have to consider the material itself. Also, of course, one big point is the explosion potential. The, for example, the MIE, the minimum ignition energy of the powder, which needs to be transferred. Um, and just to give an overview about what we have, um, it's quite rare, really, maybe only five to 10% of the cases where we have fully inert powder, a ceramic powder, a sand. Um, these fully inert powders, of course, they make uh, no problem in terms of explosion, but they make other problems. Um, but coming now to the powders we consider, uh, as an example here, spices, organic powders, which are combustible, but uh, also all the chemical powders, which we handle, but also more and more, it's coming more and more with 3D printing, of course, in the last uh, 20 years, is uh, metal powders, aluminum powder is a good example. Um, and, um, and also chemical products like, like raisin chips, where you would normally say, okay, uh, this is not a powder, uh, this is a, it's a flakes. But imagine you transfer this 100 meters with uh, 30 meters per second. It might be that in the beginning you have these flakes and at the end of the conveying line, you have a fine racing powder, which is then of course uh, ignitable again. Um, we come in a minute to our ATEC certification and we try to cover, let's say normal powders. And when I say normal powders, I mean what you see here, um, I don't mean self-ignitable powders. I don't mean um, powders which immediately react with atmosphere and create uh, explosive gases. Um, just for example, if you put water on aluminum powder, you could generate hydrogen. Of course, you should not convey it under water, of course, but all these things need to be considered. And let's say with the ATEX stuff, um, we cover this in brackets, normal powders. But over the years, experts have analyzed our systems and they found out, okay, they are free of ignition sources. Can we not use it even further? And now, now I have to say, yes, you can, but not, this is not covered. This is not covered with the, with the ATEC certification. Products like nitrocellulose or explosive materials. Uh, on this cases, we always need to have third parties 
competence, advice, maybe of the uh, manufacturers of the materials, um, if we still can convey these materials, or if we have to convey these materials already on an inert gas, uh, or and so and so and so on. So um, with this ones, um, you cannot take a conveyor out of the shelf and just convey it. Uh, for example, nitrocellulose is sometimes put in a solvent because if it dries out, it ignites itself. So it's actually put in a solvent, not to burn itself. But of course, then if you add a solvent, you not only have to consider all the, the, the powder uh, risk, now you have also a gas exon. And, and now you have to make the system safe for a gas exon. So it's, it's even more to do. Um, for example, this one's here, you have in your car, but a little bit smaller. These are the propellants for the airbags. And they are not that dangerous in the form of a tablet. But you can imagine during the manufacturing process, uh, a lot of dust is generated. And often we need to separate the dust during the conveying process from the bigger solids, because the dust, of course, is the dangerous part of this, of this uh, the extremely dangerous part of these products. So just as at a glance, some products which we convey. And then just very briefly, um, more or less everybody knows what a vacuum conveying system is, but the interesting point is really the flexibility you have in order to pick up the material here by vacuum, and then in order to discharge the material into certain process equipment. Um, and of course, um, today we are only time to see a small branch of pneumatic conveying. Today we look only at the vacuum conveying side. Um, and of course, there we are quite limited because we have only atmospheric pressure one bar to zero. So the pressure difference is only one bar. If we go to Mexico City, we might have only 800 millibars because of the altitude, uh, the, the air pressure is lower. So, um, and that makes the system especially suitable for small to mid-size conveying systems. And when I say mid-size, I, I mean a transfer rate of maybe maximum of, let's say, eight to 10 tons per hour. Um, and uh, over the years, um, of course, the, the, the range of materials to be conveyed is getting bigger and bigger. And it's always very interesting to explore a new industry uh, and learn about new solids, their behavior. Uh, so it's, it really never gets boring with all these kind of materials. And just an example, one part is often the raw materials. Uh, the raw materials are brought in the plant with big bags, with drums, with bags. And for vacuum, of course, you can say, um, I can have multiple pickup points, which means I can have, uh, first I empty a big bag, then I empty a sack, and uh, at last I empty here a drum, and I transfer the material to one central point like a mixer, like a container, like a batch weighing, uh, or whatever. So just an example for raw material handling. Um, because of the limited time, I don't want to go into all the details of how a vacuum conveyor works. Uh, on the market are many systems. The basic principles are all the same. We need a vacuum pump. We need a product inlet where the suction pipe is connected. We need at least one filter in between and then in the bottom, we need some kind of collecting and discharging device. If you want to express it simply, this looks like a vacuum cleaner with a big discharging valve. Um, so the functional principle is that you first need to fill this by closing this dump valve here at the bottom. So this is a suction cycle. And secondly, you um, discharge the material then by opening this valve. Um, we talk about pneumatic conveying. And uh, this conveyor, which you, which you see here, is also operated pneumatically, which means that the vacuum is created by compressed air using a multiple stage nozzle system, which is within this box. The compressed air is used to clean the filter with a back blowing flush. And pneumatic valves, pneumatic fluidization, pneumatic vibration is sometimes used to get the material out, which means um, you can have this unit, um, as you see it here, totally free of ignition, ignition sources because it's just operated by air. And if you take the product away, if you just let it run with air, you don't even have um, an ignition source because compressed air 
um, is, is not generating electrostatic charge, it's a pure gas. There are, should be no solids in and no liquids in. And if you just convey air, you even have no um, electrostatic charges because you're just moving air as long as there are no particles and no, no uh, drops, droplets, uh, or, or vapor in it. So the, the danger comes when you start conveying, and that is actually always the case when the customer wants to use it, he wants to convey his product. And of course, this product itself um, is gen generating the electrostatic charges. And the question is, of course, uh, how large can they be? Um, we have a certain point here with these multiple stage ejectors. We are able to pull nearly full vacuum, 91%, minus 910 millibar, we are able to generate here as a vacuum. And that has a consequence because if you look um, many years ago, like 30 years ago, um, most of these conveyors were using a centrifugal blower. And a centrifugal blower can do one thing. It can create a very, very large airflow. Um, and this airflow uh, ultimately leads to very high velocities. And we're talking about 35 meters per second, so nearly 100 kilometers per hour. So particles traveling with 100 km per hour, uh, of course, can generate quite high electrostatic charges. So in order to avoid these, what can you do? Well, you can try to convey dense phase or plug flow conveying, but you need to have then a vacuum generator, which is able to pull at least minus 700, minus 800 millibar to get these plugs through the line without blocking the line. Um, so that is essential that with these multiple stage ejectors, we are not only emission source free, but we also can come to very low conveying velocities, three meters, sometimes even one meters per second. And of course, this very low velocity in the pipe helps to prevent excessive electrostatic charges. Um, we will come in a minute to propagating brush dischargings and with lower conveying velocities, you can uh, avoid that. So, um, yeah, and that's, let's, in the end of the day, that is the task of, uh, of, uh, of a manufacturer bringing uh, equipment into the market. Um, we have to make a, a risk analysis about the potential emission sources. Um, and to make a long story short, the conveyor you have just seen, uh, we can, by design, by the design, we can rule out number one to 12, but as I already said, we cannot rule out number 13. So at number 13, we have to look at. And 13 is always a bit tricky. It comes to, to black magic. Uh, and when we do our in-house seminars, we make a lot of tests and trials to demonstrate uh, how tricky it is with electrostatic charges. Um, because often there are two things coming together. And that is also where the zone rating comes sometimes to, a, to some limitation. Here, what this guy does is he does actually does two things. He's pouring the material. Um, so by pouring it out of, let's say, a 25 kilogram plastic sack, by pouring, he generates, generates uh, electrostatic charges. And at the same time, by pouring, he's generating the dust cloud. And of course, that is uh, the two bad things you do at the same time. Uh, you generate charges and you create a potential explosive mixture in the air. And that's why also when you load your silo, and even if you load your silo with combustible material, only let's say once a year, because you have a very big silo, um, you cannot say inside the silo it's zone 22, because it's only uh, uh, filled um, once a year. If it's filled with high pressure pneumatic positive pressure conveying with high velocities, exactly at the moment when you fill it, you have the dust cloud and you have the electricity mm -hmm. charges. So um, that's, you have to bear in mind, you cannot say once a year, oh, that's 22, no, it's 20 inside usually. Yeah, and just uh, as a picture, this is the design of the conveyors, different sizes, different volumes. Um, and again, explosion protection means uh, one thing also not to make this too big, which means this diameter is less than 450, that's the biggest one, 450 millimeters. And the total volume, the filling volume is less, less than 200 liters. Uh, this is another preventive measurement 
to avoid, uh, for example, cone discharges within a conveying system. But if you have a bigger vessel, if you have a big bag, or if you have a, a bigger vessel, you have to consider also cone discharges. Yeah, and here's just to point out what's a little um, special for us. We are dealing with this. I'm 25 years now with Workman, and I think for 23 years, we are now dealing with this uh, explosions matters. Because you know, if the equipment is already free of ignition sources, uh, of course, it's, uh, uh, it puts in a position to really promote it also for explosive uh, material and to, to uh, make the systems uh, safe. Um, yeah, but of course, if you're not uh, if you if you're not ground the system, and we come now to a little bit to explosion prevention, um, if you're not ground the system, it's obvious that everywhere where you uh, move the material from the pickup point through the conveying line, through the conveying system, through the discharging point, you generate electrostatic charges. And with conveying, we always need to be caref uh, careful that, for example, if a gas X zone would be here, yeah, we would even transfer the gas X zone into here. So we always need to be very careful with conveying that we don't move gas zones in areas where previously has not been a gas uh, uh, area, I guess, for example, a gas, a sponge of gas area. And um, finally, uh, we need to look at all these potential electrostatic discharges. And today, because of the time, um, I have only, uh, I will only look at two very quickly, which is a spark discharging, which is quite well known. Um, and one which is very important for the conveying hoses, for the conveying lines, the propagating brush discharging. Um, if you look at older silos, often they have um, a filter carrier, which is metal, and then they have a filter cloth wrapped around this, this carrier. And of course, this is a big danger. If the filter cloth is an isolating material, that by mounting the filter cloth, you are isolating the filter uh, the carrier, the, the support structure. Um, and especially the filter is a uh, dangerous point because you have your back blowing usually, which means you have a dust cloud around the filter. And if, if this is an isolated part and this is, this is grounded, there's a danger that a spark uh, occurs between these both here directly into the dust cloud. And that will generate um, an explosion, for example, in a silo. And one little note in our ATIC certification is um, when we convey powders with very low MIE, uh, we are not allowed to use, use this kind of filters within the conveying system as a, as a protective measurement. Um, so um, can we use this, this principle, uh, pro preventive explosion protection? Because it's generally known that for big system, for complex system, for a dryer, for a big filter, for a big silo, uh, it cannot be used because the system, you cannot overlook really. So what you really have to do is you have to look at all the details. Is it really safely grounded by design the system? Um, is one grounding port sufficient to ground everything securely, even if you have some flexible connections here? And all these things need to be analyzed on the system. This cannot be said in general. And only by doing that, you may come to a conclusion, and if you, if you cannot do it, you have to use third parties advice here that, uh, that on, on, on small systems, um, you can use this as a preventive measurement against explosion. But as soon as you build this substantially bigger, you have to go to constructive uh, explosion protection, like you have seen in the previous lectures. So this is quite a good, good adder to this. Yeah, and finally, uh, very quickly, the hoses. It's always funny. Uh, some the worst thing you can do is uh, let's say use this one and not ground the wire at the end because um, if you then convey, you have a nice spark generator often here at the end of the wire, one centimeter to metal, and, and the sparks fly. Um, and there was a misunderstanding. These wires are not for the grounding. These wires are there for making the hose vacuum resistant. If you go to 900 millibar vacuum, a normal hose would shrink. So this wire wrapping is for mechanical stability. And of course, um, this could be, if you would now convey and not ground it, you would charge the wire, although it's not in touch with the product to be conveyed by induction. Um, and this could uh, generate sparks here on the wire. 
So the wire needs to be grounded, that's for sure. But what about here in between the wire? Thomas? Yes. Okay. Oh, sorry. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> I speed up. Uh, when finally, um, you know, these guys um, at the time they were working um, at these uh, empl uh, employers, they were occupying for one week our test center. They conveyed one week material from A to B and measured um, the electrostatic field. And finally, they came to this value. And this is uh, also now in the documents, the TRGS 727. That is the one for electrostatic charges. There was a bit of confusion in the old one, uh, which is now gone. So this is the right uh, reference for all these electrostatic things. We jump TRGS. in. Sorry? We jump in because there is a question in the chat, and it would be very, very sad if we, Mr. Hofmann couldn't. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm finished. So, you know, this is just the last slide, the next one. So, thank you very much for your attention, and uh, sorry for being a little bit over the time. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Thomas. And uh, the first question is for Mr. Hoffman. And yeah, Mr. Hoffman, please ask Thomas directly. Yeah, so again, hopefully now the, the connection will be a bit better. I hope yeah, you understand I me. Better, yes. Um, yeah, because we are manufacturing um, the filter products and, and the bags used for in these applications, in the filters, and we, uh, we have dedicated conductive filters because you said yeah, you are not allowed to use bags and this kind of filters in, in an ATEX uh, area. But what if the, the filter material is conductive and even certified as conductive uh, through DECRA or TÜV? And could you use that then in, in this type of application? Well, um, what we need to differentiate is, um, do, we talk about, um, do we talk about powder, a pure powder area, or is there any chance that there's a flammable solvent present. Uh, just one thing, for example, this brush discharging, we, we had not the time to discuss that. For example, brush discharging, to the current state of knowledge, brush discharging are not ignitable for powders, even with low MIEs, but are ignitable for flammable gases or vapors. So, um, and they occur between a non-conductive oh, sorry, um, um, a non-conductive surface which uh, you can imagine, let's say, imagine here a non-conductive surface and a conductor. Um, so this could be a plastic bag, for example. Um, and this brush, brush discharging, you could tolerate in a pure powder environment, but you can absolutely not tolerate them in a, in a gas area. Um, and that's, for, for example, the reason when we convey around gas, explosive, potential explosive gas areas, we, have, we often have to modify the conveyors that we convey under inert conditions, that we convey under inert gas to get the oxygen out of the system. This is one of the next questions. Uh, just let me interfere. Is it possible conveying under inert conditions? Yes. Um, and I mean, in the end of the day, you know, we just need a carrier medium for the solids. And that could be argon, that could be nitrogen. Uh, there could be CO2, um, and uh, also you have to ask yourself, where does the gas exome come from? Is it already at the pickup point, or is it coming to place at the discharging point? Because in the pharma industry, in the, in the chemical industry, a lot of uh, chemical steering vessels and reactors are loaded, and they often have, have already a gas exome. So you want to transfer your powder into this gas exome. And then it's sufficient to inert at the end of the conveying line, to inert at the vacuum conveyor, which is then modified as a kind of powder lock to get the oxygen out and the nitrogen in and then to discharge. But if you have already the gas X zone at the pickup point, you need to replace your conveying gas, which is normally ambient air, with an inert gas. And okay. that is done, that is done. But Sometimes people say, oh, that's quite expensive. You know, if you have metal powder and you use argon, you lose a lot of expensive argon to transfer the material. Even though with dense phase conveying, you need much less conveying air or gas as with, uh, with, uh, uh, with um, dilute phase conveying. So you can 
influence the consumption of gas by using dense phase and plug flow conveying, but still it could be expensive. So there are already systems on the market where the exhaust air in this tank gas of the vacuum pump is transferred back to the feeding point um, so that the, that the inert gas is run in a more or less closed loop cycle and that you don't uh, have to buy always uh, new uh, Arden at the feeding point to get the conveying running. But of course, these are quite complex systems I have not, 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 not covered here. Okay, thank you, Thomas.